my name is Brandon. Uh, I, uh, this is actually my first Rails Conf, and this is actually my first attempt at this talk, so bear with me. Uh, you're in for, in for some fun. Um, but uh, I, am, uh, I work on uh, MongoDB. Uh, I work for Tengen on MongoDB. I work on the drivers team there, and specifically what I work on is the Ruby driver for MongoDB. Um, and uh, my role at Tengen is, has a couple different pieces to it. One part is making sure people are using MongoDB effectively and, uh, and uh, you know, maintaining the Ruby driver, the Ruby client for MongoDB. But the other part of it is actually uh, being kind of a proponent for open source and being a proponent for the Ruby community in general. Um, and that's actually what I'm here about today. I'm not here to talk about MongoDB. I might mention it a few more times, but it's uh, not what the talk's about. The talk is about the Ruby community um, and uh, specifically about natural language processing in Ruby. Um, what it is, what it means, and uh, you know, how, you can, how you can get into uh, this particular field uh, in the language we all love. So like I said, I currently work for Tengen. Um, some of my past employers uh, include companies, uh, Facebook, uh, Rombi, company in San Diego that does business intelligence, and MySpace. I worked on the developer platform there for a while. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, I want to reiterate that, like, you know, the, the role here and the reason we're here, uh, Tengen is here, the people that I work for, uh, is just because we care a lot about the Ruby community and we want to invest in the Ruby community. We want to uh, inspire you to invest in the Ruby community as well. You're part of it. You might as well make it better. Um, and that's what we're here for. So a little bit about me. Um, I, I think there's uh, <clears throat> too many prominent Rubyists that like cats. Uh, so I kind of feel like I have to represent the dog crowd. And <clears throat> this, is, this is my dog. Her name is Somi, she drools a lot, she snores louder than me, and she's shaped like a potato. <clears throat> but you can't say no to her, she's adorable. <clears throat> and here are my credentials. This is me. Uh, in case anyone doubted, I'm the real deal. And in case you missed it, that's a Klingon, a Romulan, a Ninja Turtle t-shirt, and Pepsi shorts. So, <clears throat> I kind of, um, you know, I've been a nerd my whole life. I'm, I'm as real as it gets. I kind of think my parents should be punished for allowing that, but it happened. It's there. So this talk, um, let's go over the goals and agenda, like kind of what I want to cover in this talk. <clears throat> Natural language processing in general is a huge topic. It's incredibly broad. Uh, it encompasses a number of other fields within computer science. It's not just limited to this one specific thing. Uh, there's a lot of things that you could kind of lump under this category. So I'll give you kind of a quick view of what I'm going to hope to cover in this short 40 minutes. So I'm going to do a quick introduction to natural language processing, what it is, uh, why it's so difficult, what the challenges are, uh, and why it's important, why you should care about it, why it's meaningful. Uh, I'll go over uh, the tools that are available currently, uh, what kind of is the, the leading industry tool sets that are being used here, how Ruby measures up, um, and then we'll talk about how to bridge the gaps where Ruby doesn't measure up. So. <clears throat> And then uh, wrapping up, we'll talk about uh, basically what to do next if you want to learn more about this topic, where to go, how to dig in more, and uh, get more involved in this particular, uh, this particular part of the community. So natural language processing. We'll start with a definition. This is my definition. Um, I'm no expert. I'm just a guy who learned something, and I'm sharing it. But it's basically analyzing and understanding, analyzing, understanding, and generating the language that humans use to interface with computers. Uh, in short, this is making computers understand uh, human language, uh, both generating it and understanding it and parsing it their own way. <clears throat> it sounds incredibly vague, because it is incredibly vague. <laughs> um, like I said, this is a huge topic that wraps up a bunch of other things. Um, it's, it's, it's the bleeding edge of computer science. It's an intersection of a number of different studies. Um, <clears throat> and it's, uh, you know, it's something that actually is very relevant to all of us and very relevant to what we do. Um, there's a lot of applications for it. So some common solutions or some common problems that people try to solve with natural language processing is search, uh, spell checking, auto summarization, predictive text, content categorization, machine translation, Google Translate, what you see, that falls under this category as well, and a lot more. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it'd be very hard for every one of us to think about you know, if you had a perfect computer system that could perfectly and flawlessly translate to and from text and understand human speech and understand human writing and generate human language, uh, there's almost no end of applications for that kind of technology. Um, it's a big deal. 
And <clears throat> in short, it kind of falls into to three basic categories, which is searching information, extracting information, and grouping information. That's kind of a high level, like more or less all the different components of this. There's also um, you know, things like Siri and things like OCR, image recognition, that kind of stuff, text recognition. Those things actually fall under this umbrella as well. Um, but they're, they're, kind of, um, they're kind of a huge beast within their own. So I'm actually kind of excluding them from this topic. We're mostly going to talk about uh, natural language processing in the form of text, um, not get into speech and OCR. So uh, why is it so hard? Uh, you know, it's just another language. Uh, it has rules, it has syntax, it has grammar. Uh, why is it that computers have such a hard time dealing with this? Why is it that this is such a challenge for us? I'll give you a good example. Maybe you guys have seen this before. This right here. Anybody seen that before? A lot of people. It was on Hacker News a few weeks ago, so you might have seen it. This is a perfectly valid, grammatically correct English sentence. And it makes sense almost not to us at all, right? What's actually happening here is there's three uses of the word buffalo. Buffalo the noun, the bison, the animal. Buffalo the verb, which means to like bully and intimidate someone. And then buffalo the name place, uh, which I also accidentally labeled as a verb. Um, <laughs> the city of Buffalo, New York. Um, and basically what this sentence is actually saying is it's talking about buffaloes from the city of Buffalo who are buffaloing other buffaloes from the city of Buffalo. So it's a little bit confusing, but it's actually grammatically correct. It follows the rules of our language. But you know, even for us who, you know, we've studied our entire life and we've trained from birth to learn our own language, we look at this and it's a little confusing to us. Uh, imagine what a computer has to do here. A computer has no idea what's happening in this situation, what this sentence actually means. <clears throat> Context is important. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's a very hard topic. It's a very hard problem to solve. Um, the other interesting thing about it is there's really no perfect solution. There no perfect, or at least to date, no perfect solution exists. Um, even the experts in this field often disagree amongst each other about what the best solution is. And they disagree about the results that, that come out. Um, <clears throat> fixing one thing often leads to problems elsewhere. Um, but you know, at the same time, the applications here are, are immense. Um, you know, we use the results of this particular field of study every day. Google search, predictive text here. That's exactly, um, it's exactly what we're talking about. Um, the other challenge is that uh, language itself is a moving target. So different cultures, different grammar, different syntax, that's one thing. Uh, language is constantly evolving. New slang, new terms, new usages of, of things. Um, you think about words that have changed meaning over time, or you know, words like love. People say, I love pizza, I love food, I love Ninja Turtles, I love whatever. Um, it kind of means different things in different contexts, uh, and it has different uh, implications in different contexts. Um, and this is something that's hard for a, a computer system to grasp. Um, <clears throat> technical, technological advances also influence language quite a lot. <clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but um, my my wife laughs at me all the time. We were actually just talking the other day. Uh, I, she pulled up some notes of mine that I wrote about six months ago, and she couldn't read it. And she was trying to figure out what it said, and she handed it to me and asked me what it said. And I couldn't figure out what it said. I couldn't read my own handwriting. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this is not an uncommon occurrence. It happens all the time, even with something I wrote a week ago. And it's kind of the result of me being at a keyboard, I think, for the last decade. So I just don't know how to write. I think all through college, I used like two pencils and two pens and didn't really write at all. <laughs> and you know, that's changing the way I write. That's changing my, my, my uh, ability to, to, to write by hand. Um, but you also have you know, mobile. You have instant messaging. You have all sorts of different technologies that have been introduced into the culture in the last couple decades that influence the way we talk. Um, the way you chat in an SMS message is not the way you chat more kind of long form in an email or a letter. <clears throat> and the same can be said about numerous technologies. They influence the way we talk, they influence our grammar, our language, <clears throat> and the way we communicate with each other. The other problem is that um, <clears throat> many aspects of natural language processing, many problems that it tries to solve are just incredibly computationally complex. Um, 10 years ago, uh, you know, today versus 10 years ago, there, there are aspects of computer uh, natural language processing that we kind of take for granted today. Things like predictive text, things like search, that if you roll back 10 years, they didn't exist. Um, and it was largely because it just wasn't possible at the time on hardware. It wasn't possible 
people hadn't solved the problems yet. Um, <clears throat> it's becoming a little bit less of an issue because obviously hardware has advanced, hardware is more available, hardware is cheaper. Ten years ago, you didn't have the ability to spin up a bunch of Amazon instances and chew away at a problem like you do now. Um, it's a different world. So that's kind of helping, uh, that's just the extra computing power. But there's still, there's still problems that extra computing power won't quite solve. Um, <clears throat> there are numerous aspects to natural language, pro natural language processing that are, <clears throat> a lot of the outstanding problems are considered AI complete. And what that means is that uh, the difficulty in involved in, in solving these problems is equivalent to that of solving the central artificial intelligence problem. Basically, <clears throat> in short, um, you're not going to figure out how to solve some of these problems until you figure out how to pass the Turing test and make a, <clears throat> make a computer as smart or un unidentifiably different than a human, uh, which is non-trivial. That's a big deal. That's some, uh, some sci-fi stuff. So. <clears throat> so why is it important? It's this thing off in the distance, you know, solving some of these big AI problems are way off in the distance. Sure, there are things available to me today, but why as a developer do I need to care about these big problems? And specifically, why as a Rubyist do I need to care about these big problems? So this is a pie chart. No presentation is complete without a pie chart. So here's a pie chart. This is a pie chart that shows what the average US worker, how the average US worker spent their time in a given work week. <clears throat> and as you can see here, uh, about 39% of it is role-specific tasks. That's basically the real work. 14% uh, of it is collaboration, or as I like to call it, useless meetings and overhead. Um, and then the other part of it is search, and employees looking for information. And then the big chunk of it there, that 28%, is, uh, is actually email, reading email, gathering information, information that's being sent to me and parsing and understanding that email. So <clears throat> when you break this down, roughly half the week, 45, 47%, is spent sorting through and searching information. Um, and that's not that efficient. Uh, it's you know, roughly 20 to 25 hours of a, of a 40 hour work week. You're spending just sifting through info. Uh, and you know, it, when <clears throat> this particular study that, that did this, they also had some numbers in there about what this cost to the average employer. Uh, inefficient, basically employees who have a hard time finding what they need. Um, basically what this costs a company in time that they pay this employee where they're not actually doing their their role-specific tasks. Instead, they're sifting through info. So kind of the, the, the core concept here is that you know, your users are absolutely buried under immense amounts of data that they don't know what to do with. And <clears throat> the only way to help them with this is to, uh, to make that process of finding what they need and getting what they need and extracting what they need out of it simpler and more efficient. <clears throat> so the you know, the other side of this is that uh, demand for solutions here are, are not going away. It's actually increasing quite steeply, the need and demand. Um, the problem space is actually growing. There's way more data out there to sift through than there was a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, every startup has a big data problem these days. So, you know, I work at MongoDB. Our whole thing is scalability. We try to help you scale your data set. And, um, you know, I run into people all the time, and I'm, I'm continually amazed at how much data they're dealing with on a regular basis, on a daily basis, just immense amounts of data. Some fun facts about data growth. <clears throat> so photos, uh, es experts estimate that over 4 billion were taken in the last year alone. Um, just to kind of put that in perspective, that's actually more than all the photos estimated taken in the rest of human history. So it's a lot of photos. Nowadays, everyone has a camera in their pocket, and uh, there's just photos constantly. I took one a few minutes ago. And it's just, it's an immense amount of data that's going to everybody's servers right now. It's fourfold over what, what was being produced last decade in photos alone. <clears throat> and uh, roughly about 50% find their way onto the internet via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. <clears throat> so, you know, it's, and it's an immense amount of data. Um, and, you know, that's one side of it. Information in general, though, um, this study from IDC, International Data Corporation, it's actually from 2011. It's old numbers. They estimated back then that we as a global industry produce 1.8 zettabytes annually of data. To clarify, that's a one with 21 zeros behind it. I didn't put it on the slide because it doesn't fit. Um, it's a lot of data. And the crazy part about it is they, they estimate that that will increase 50-fold by 2020. So 
That's the kind of data we're talking about. This is the kind of data that your users are, are basically having to sift through. It's not a shrinking problem, it's a growing problem. <clears throat> and uh, you know, the amount of time your workers and your users invest every week uh, to try to find what they need uh, is probably gonna go up unless we help them solve it. So with natural language processing, there's typically three common approaches that people take to solving a lot of these challenges. One is kind of a rule-based rule -based analytics, uh, rule-based analysis of text. Um, this is, uh, you can see this in, in, in applications like actually active record or active support is a good example of this. The, the pluralization that active support does and the, the ordinal uh, conversion that active support does is actually rule-based. Um, the other approach is statistical analysis. Um, <clears throat> there's actually a really cool paper um, from a while back. Does anybody watch the show Death Note? Anybody heard of Death Note? It's an anime, it's a great anime, you should check it out. So there's this guy, um, I totally forget his name, but he wrote a paper a while back where he, uh, back in 2009, somebody leaked a script for the Death Note movie or what was supposed to be a script for the Death Note movie. And everyone was trying to figure out who wrote it, who was responsible for writing this thing. And this guy actually took, um, did a lot of work trying to narrow it down to a couple possible candidates. And you know, he ended up taking the script, breaking it apart, looking for common engrams, common pieces of words and phrases. Um, and then he did cluster analysis on it, uh, used an Euclidean uh, distance to figure out exactly uh, how similar all these different scripts were. He included a bunch of fan fiction, included other like known works by the authors he was kind of suspecting might have done it. <clears throat> and in the end, he was able to come pretty close, probably like an 85% guess that um, you know, he had found the author of this particular script. It's kind of a cool use of statistical, the statistical approach. <clears throat> the other approach is the one that we kind of touched on a little bit, which is machine learning. <clears throat> and that's, uh, you know, that's where the AI stuff comes in. That's where some of the harder problems come in. Um, but at the same time, this is actually one of the more effective approaches, um, which I'll show you a little bit of that a little bit later on. So the reality is, though, that most of the systems we have today, some of the most effective solutions we have currently, rely on a human-in-the-loop approach, learning from user feedback, um, rating things up or down, this was good, this was not good. You see this, like your, in your, uh, you, see this, you see this actually all over the place. You see this in uh, you know, ads on Facebook. This is why Facebook collects likes. You know, it's, it's the exact same concept. They're learning from uh, what they know they're giving you, and they're trying to make sense of it on, on their end. Um, but this is also, uh, there's this whole concept of being able to train, um, being able to train models in uh, natural language processing, which I'll show you a little bit later. Um, but it's the same, same concept. I basically will go through and tell it, this is a bunch of text that represents this one particular category, so now you've learned how to how to understand this particular category, but still involves a human manually teaching the computer what to do. <clears throat> so real quick, let's cover kind of like the basic, some of the basic building blocks behind natural language processing. There's all sorts of, like I said, there's all sorts of applications, all sorts of problems you can solve with this particular topic. Um, but some of the core building blocks to getting there are these items here. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on all of these, but I'll kind of explain from a high level what they are. Parts of speech tagging, uh, so basically identifying like nouns, uh, places, verbs, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> word stimming, so trying to find the root word. This is a pretty common uh, tactic for uh, full text search. Uh, MongoDB actually implemented full text search in its latest version and it uses exactly this. It finds the, the word stem of a particular phrase um, and indexes on that. Tokenizing, uh, so breaking up a block of text or a sentence into words and tokens that it can, it can then do something with. Sentence detection is what it sounds like. Named entity recognition, that's a big one. Actually, that's a, a little bit more challenging, but that's actually really core to a lot of the, the big problems in, in natural language processing, which is being able to look at a block of text and pull out places and names and, and things like you know, Google and Facebook and you know, Tyler and whatever else. These are, these are, this is pretty critical to understanding the context of a given block of text. So <clears throat> it's, it's, it's these basic building blocks that basically give you the ability to do everything else that you need to do in natural language processing, or at least a lot of the things you need to do. <clears throat> and you know, getting to the core of, of what this talk is about, which is uh, you know, trying to show you how to use these things, uh, it's important to talk about what's available and what's out there. Kind of the, the, leading, 
the leading thing out there that, that linguists, the leading library that linguists tend to lean on is actually Python's natural language processing toolkit. Um, there is honestly nothing else like this out there for any other language. This is an extremely mature, um, very thorough library. It's backed very heavily um, <clears throat> by the academic world. You have a lot of uh, like uh, Stanford professors and, and MIT professors and a lot of people contributing to this thing on a daily basis. It relies very heavily on Python scientific, um, scientific calculation libraries like SciPy and NumPy, um, which we honestly just don't have any equivalent of in the Ruby community. Um, and you know, it's just, this is a very well-established library that uh, you know, <clears throat> a lot of people use. Um, Python was chosen as a language for this particular effort uh, because of its expressiveness and its ease of use. Um, <clears throat> and one thing that's always kind of ate at me is that you know, I feel like Ruby definitely falls under that bucket as well. We don't have quite the same pull in the academic world, but there's absolutely no reason why Ruby couldn't do the same. <clears throat> so what about Ruby? What kind of things do we have available in Ruby? <clears throat> the short answer is not much. There's been a lot of good efforts, but there's not a whole lot. So this is one library, Chronic. I'm sure many of you have seen this before. This is actually a very commonly used Ruby gem. Um, Chronic takes date times and parses them into something the computer will understand, parses them into a date time type. And it does this from a variety of different things. So it can take like this Tuesday at 5 p.m. and make sense of it. It's a great library. It's pretty well maintained, very active. Um, and I think a lot of Ruby gems actually rely on this one. So it's pretty good. There's another one here called Linguistics. Um, this one is probably closest to what you see in active support, with active supports like plural method. Um, it's very similar. This thing will do plurals. Uh, for example, you can do spy.en for English, dot a, and it'll produce the phrase a spy. Um, it is pretty good about um, ordinals and num words. It even does verb conjugation. It also has some additional stuff that I didn't add here in the examples, but it has like inflection, uh, a number of things that it can do. It's kind of a a beefed up version of what you get through active support. <clears throat> Another one here worth mentioning is the punct segmenter. This is actually a, uh, an, a it actually relies on a C extension. Um, it's a port from basically what you see in the Python natural language processing toolkit. And the purpose of this particular library and this particular Ruby gem is to uh, basically pull apart text and identify sentences. So, Going back to those common basic building blocks we saw before, this is a pretty integral part to, to most natural language processing challenges. Um, <clears throat> this also, if you notice in the, in the bottom part of that example, um, there's a, an option to train, uh, which basically lets you tag a bunch of text, uh, basically lets you take a bunch of example text broken up into sentences already, feed it to this thing so it knows what kind of structure, what kind of text you're dealing with, and you can theoretically train it to uh, you know, work with something that's not normal. So another one worth mentioning here is uh, Ruby Stemmer. This is uh, not quite as well maintained. It's a, a little bit uh, inactive actually at the moment. I think the last commit was about a year ago, so <laughs> it's pretty old. Um, but it actually uses the, uh, the Snowball. It exposes the Snowball uh, Stemmer API. Um, and uh, you know, the purpose here is to basically find the, the, the root word of a particular word. So for potatoes, for example, it returns the word potato. Uh, and if I were, you know, building a database or trying to build up a hash of, of, of values of, of like words or related words, um, I could use that as an, an index or a key. The last one I'll show you for Ruby here is a library called Treat. Um, this one actually... It's actually pretty cool. Uh, the effort here is pretty neat. I think he basically needs some more contributors. Uh, it's a lot of work that he's trying to pull off here, but he's basically trying to create the Ruby equivalent to the, uh, the natural language processing toolkit that you find in Python. And what he's done here is he's actually gathered together a number of, uh, of related libraries and tools that exist in Ruby to help you do a lot of these common natural language processing related tasks. Um, it's a very good library. Again, it, it does kind of suffer from uh, not being as complete as something like Python's uh, Natural Language Processing Toolkit, simply because it lacks a lot of the scientific libraries that we just don't have in Ruby. Nobody's built them yet. Um, so kind of a challenge for him, uh, but it's a really good library, and I, it's definitely very active, and I recommend you check that out. So these are all great, <clears throat> but what happens when you need more? What happens when you do something, want to do something bigger than pluralization or basic sentence 
uh, detection or stemming. Uh, you actually want to build a really, truly awesome scalable system. You want to do it in Ruby, uh, and you want to leverage a lot of these NLP techniques. So, enter JRuby. Uh, how many people use JRuby in here? I like the number of hands. That's really good. <clears throat> so, for those of you who don't know what JRuby is, uh, it's more than just this thing that breaks your gym all the time. It is... It is Ruby on the JVM, uh, and it's actually pretty amazing. Um, and I know what a lot of you are thinking. Oh my god, did he just say Java? Um, it's not as bad as you think. It's actually pretty amazing. Um, it's actually this really, really cool thing. So I could actually talk for hours about how much I love JRuby and all the cool things JRuby has to offer. I know my teammates all the time talking about this stuff. But it's the Ruby you know and love combined with true multi-core concurrency, there's no global interpreter lock. You can use more than one core. <clears throat> the portability of Java, it'll run anywhere Java runs. <clears throat> you, get, uh, you get a JIT compiler at runtime. You can actually pre-compile all your Ruby code into Java bytecode and just deploy it as Java bytecode. Um, and uh, you get real globals and constants. These are just some of the cool advantages in, uh, in JRuby. Um, you also get like, much more control over the underlying VM and much more control over things like garbage control, things that you don't really get in Ruby MRI. But the reason I bring it up is because the coolest part about JRuby is that it allows you to leverage well-established, mature Java libraries from within your Ruby code. So, you know, as I was mentioning before, Python has a lot of really good uh, tools that you can use uh, for natural language processing, a lot of really well-established, advanced tools. The next runner-up is Java, to be honest. It's got the most academic backing, a lot of the same stuff that you'll find in Python. The other nice part about Java is it's, you know, it is what it is, but it's great at scaling. Um, you get great languages like, or great tools like uh, Apache Tika for text extraction. That's a great tool. Uh, you have uh, Mahout, which is machine learning, scalable machine learning. Um, and then you have lots of natural language processing libraries like OpenNLP, um, Gate, and uh, Lingpipe. All of them are very good. Um, I tend to lean on open NLP just because I like the licensing better than some of the other options. But, you know, the point is, um, run your Ruby code on JRuby and you can start tapping into these things. So, I'm going to take you through a quick example. Um, it's going to be a little bit fast, but I'm going to take you through a quick example of summarizing text using JRuby and pulling in some of these libraries. So, <clears throat> this is actually a pretty neat, naive uh, way of summarizing text. It's very simple. Um, but, you know, the main purpose here is to show you how you can use some of these libraries. Um, I'm going to use OpenNLP, and the steps we're going to go through is we're going to basically tokenize the text we receive. We're going to remove stop words from it. Stop words are words like and, the, it, is, basically words that don't have a lot of semantic meaning. Uh, and then we're going to rank relevant words. We're going to rank those words based on how many times we see them. And then we're going to uh, extract sentences from the text and then rank the sentences, basically figure out which of these sentences show these important words the most, these relevant words the most, and return a summary. So we'll start off by actually requiring our, uh, our open NLP and the Snowball lib stemmer. Um, Snowball is just for, for word stemming, and the open NLP, NLP is actually our, our NLP framework. Um, I'm also including Java IO to handle some file stream, uh, file input stream objects that I need to create. But these are actually just jar files I downloaded. I didn't have to do anything special other than put them in the same directory that I'm running this file from. No maven or anything crazy like that. <clears throat> so I'm declaring a couple things up front, a couple constants. Min size is basically the, the minimum word length that I want to care about. Any word shorter than four, I don't care about. Uh, the sentences I want back, I want a three-sentence summary out of this. <clears throat> and then I'm telling it where my stop words file lives. Um, there's actually some really great, one of the other Ruby gems that I didn't mention is there's a Ruby gem called a Ruby WordNet or RB WordNet. Um, <clears throat> but it basically is a Ruby gem that packages up the Word, WordNet database for you. WordNet database has pretty good stop words. Um, it's actually kind of an important thing that I kind of left out of this talk. But um, one other kind of basic building block of natural language processing is being able to identify synonyms and related words. Um, WordNet is great for that. It's a giant open source database, again, backed by the academic community, that allows you to basically say, uh, give me a word and give me all the 
gives me the sin sets, other words that are similar to this word, and kind of helps you uh, understand. Uh, it's really good for like co-reference resolution. So anyway, I've got this stop words text file. It's just one that I pulled off the internet um, to help filter out the, the meaningless words. So the next step is to tokenize the text we receive. And the way we do that is we include the tokenized package from, uh, from OpenNLP uh, so that we can use the classes in there. And uh, first thing I need to do is set up a model. I'm actually using, this goes back to the training that I was telling you before, but this is one of the trained models. It's meant for English. It's a generic English trained model that came with OpenNLP. It's free to use. Um, obviously, if you were dealing with something more specific or a different language, you may want to actually train your own model, consider training your own model, or use something different. Um, but in this case, I'm just using the stock one. So I'm creating a model instance. That tokenized model is actually a Java class. Looks like Ruby. I'm not really doing a whole lot different. The one kind of big noticeably different thing is that rather than using file new or something like that, I'm having to use the file input stream for Java. So then I'm creating uh, this tokenizer instance, and I'm giving it the model that I created. Um, and the tokenizer is going to help me pull apart this text um, and give me the tokens back. So the next step is to remove the stop words, uh, which is as simple as reading in the stop word list uh, and then rejecting everything that's in that list or anything that's below the min size that I care about. And uh, passing the tokens to that method. So Next up, we'll rank these words. Uh, a little bit more Java creeped in this time, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I'm creating a stemmer instance. I'm using, again, the Snowball uh, API. Uh, and I'm creating a stemmer instance here, an English stemmer. Um, and I'm telling it to give me the, the stem of this word that I'm passing in. This is kind of an ugly little method here. It's a little helper that I created just because I don't want to have to do this little rigmarole every time I need to stem a word. Um, but um, this is unfortunately just a limitation of the, the Snowball API underneath the hood. But the result is that I can now rank these words. And I do that by looping through the words that I have and looking at the word stem. Um, seeing how many times I've seen this word and basically just incrementing counter using the word stem as a key. Uh, and the end result is that I've produced this uh, array at the end. That's the top 100 words I found in this text. Next step is to extract the sentences. So we'll go back to open NLP here. We'll pull down the sentence detector package. Um, I'll create my model again, just like we saw before. And I'll create the sentence detector, pass it in the model, uh, and pass it the text and have it give me back the sentences that it's able to identify. So next step is to rank the sentences. And what this little block of code here is doing is that it's going through all the sentences that we found. Um, and for each one, it's incrementing a counter to see how many times, or uh, how, basically how many of the relevant words that we found, the rank words that we found, exist in each of these sentences. And it's creating a rank for the sentences as well. And the last step here is that we actually uh, create the summary, generate the summary. And we do this by going through the sentence ranks and pulling out, uh, in descending order, pulling out the, the top ranked sentences, the sentences that had the most of these relevant words. And I basically just put them onto an array, push them onto an array until I hit the max size that I want, which is that sentence count of three. So it'll basically find me the, f the, the first, the top three most relevant sentences in this paragraph do a simple join and give me back a string. So it's, it's pretty naive. It's naive in the sense that um, you know, we're not caring about words less than, than four characters long. Um, there's nothing special here. But you'd be surprised at actually how remarkably accurate this is at, at producing pretty good summaries of, uh, of most texts. Um, you can obviously tweak this algorithm a lot. You can train your own data. There's a lot of things you can do here to make this better. Um, but the whole point of me doing this exercise was not to show you the best summarizer in the world. It's not. Um, the whole point of me doing this was to show you how easy it is to pull in Java code and use it in Ruby, how painless it is. Um, it's not very much like Java. It doesn't hurt. You don't have to go home and cry at night about it. It's actually uh, it's not too bad. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a way for you to leverage really big libraries that we have gaps for in the Ruby community right now. So, Kind of what's next and, and where uh, I'd like to challenge you guys to go from here. One of the reasons I have an interest in this topic and one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up is because uh, it kind of, 
I want to see Ruby excel as a language and Ruby grow as a language and Ruby grow as a community. Um, this is very much the tip of the spear in computer, computer science. This is bleeding edge. This is stuff that's uh, you know, very hard, real problems that a lot of people are trying to solve. Not only that, but they're problems that, if solved, can really add a lot of value to people's lives. Um, and it's, it's something that um, we're pretty inactive on as, uh, you know, as a whole in the Ruby community, and I'd like to see more of us get involved with it. So, so part of my challenge is, you know, obviously making sure you guys understand like some of the solutions that exist out there today, some of the libraries you can use today, but also challenge you to, to jump in and contribute and learn more um, and help get Ruby more involved in this particular part of computer science. So, you know, one aspect of this is learn more. Um, and one of the things I'd say about this is don't be afraid to play with other languages. Play with the Python's, Python's Natural Language Processing Toolkit. Play with Java. Um, play with a lot of the C and C++ libraries that exist for the same stuff. Um, it's, it's, good to, it's good to expand. It's good to be a polyglot. It's good to, to get experience from these other communities. Additionally, there's really great courses from universities like Stanford and MIT. Stanford has a really good natural language processing uh, course that they do like once a year. It's free. It's on Coursera. I would encourage you to sign up for that. And also just, you know, less Game of Thrones and more books. And uh, a couple I would recommend. Uh, Machine Learning for Hackers. It's a really good breed. Uh, and Natural Language Processing for Python. Um, the second book here is actually really great, especially if you're thinking about contributing to Ruby libraries for natural language processing. Um, it's a very practical, hands-on, mostly just shows you how to use the, the natural language processing toolkit for Python. Um, and it's a good way to get a good sense of, of what a complete, really full library looks like and what kind of tools other developers have. Uh, so the other part I'd say is contribute. Um, you know, a couple of things worth just throwing up there right now. Treat, which is one of the libraries I highlighted, um, he's looking for tons of contributors right now. Um, and there's lots of stuff that can be done there. Uh, and SciRuby. I don't know if you guys have heard that, but it's actually uh, the goal is to create a, a, a scientific module that's similar to SciPy and NumPy uh, for Ruby. And uh, these guys are working very hard at it. They need more people as well. So if you're game, jump in, contribute. And last, uh, do what I did here today. Learn about a topic, dive into it, take it apart, see how it works, and, uh, and share. Um, share that knowledge. If you want to grow the community, make sure the community learns along with you. So go to local meetups, go to tech talks at your workplace, blogs, whatever. Um, just share what you learn. Uh, so that's pretty much it. I, you know, I just want to challenge you guys to, uh, you know, to not be afraid of big computer problems. Ruby is more than websites. Ruby is more than little scripts. Ruby is an awesome, expressive, robust language. Um, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be tackling massive problems like this. So that's it.